The man who knows more than most about these comics is Dennis Gifford, who's written the complete guide to comics. And he's with me today to talk a little bit about them. We've got some of his originals as well. When did you first get uh, interested in comics, Dennis? Oh, well, it was really in, in the 30s. I was very young. I was about three years old, and my auntie used to come every Friday with a comic in her Mac pocket. And then one day, I thought this was the only comic in the world mm. that she brought me. And then one day she gave me the tuppence. She said, I hadn't got, I couldn't, hadn't got time to get you a comic. Here's tuppence, go to the newsagent by yourself. And I went dashing down, you see, bought my first comic. Actually, I bought my first two comics because I found to my amazement you could buy penny comics. Two penny comics for the price of tuppence, one tuppence. Gosh, she must have felt a million there. was really when I started piling well, them up. What was the first special one that you got hold of? Oh, well, I brought it along today, actually. Mickey Mouse Weekly number one, which I think... I mean, you'll agree, it's an absolute gem. And when did of that, that come colour. out? 1936. It was one of the. It was the first number one I ever bought mm. all by myself. You know, when I discovered that comics actually started. And of course, number one comics are enormous collectors' items today. So much is that worth today, roughly? Oh, ten or fifteen pounds, mm. something like that, with a, an average edition about five pounds. But um, they're getting more collected all the time, of course. But uh, the 30s was the great golden age of comics, and probably the absolute gem, in my opinion, is Happy Days. Uh, not just the number one, but this is the Christmas number, where the artist, Roy Wilson, really went to town. He was the only artist, by the way, before the war allowed to sign his work. They, mm. they so respected him. And of course, that's one of the problems of British comics, is who drew what. But of course, comics weren't only for kids. They did start out as adult well, entertainment, they did. didn't they? They did. I mean, there's a long, it's, it's a long evolution, you see. I mean, this actually shows you how long a comic can run. It's the longest run. That's a very rare sight. It's the number one of comic cuts, which was 1890, mm -hmm. and the very last edition, number 3003, I think it is, a very odd number, which was when? 1955. And uh, you can see it's not a lot of difference. I mean, the lettering is very similar between That's the two. Right. And of this course, colour, the advent of colour. But you've got earlier comics than that, because this one actually dates from the 19th century. Yes, it does. It's uh, Alice Sloper's Half Holiday. And in fact, Alice Sloper's even older. This was 1884. Mm -hmm. And he'd actually been running for 15 years already. And he's really the world's first. This is Alice Sloper up in this corner. He is the world's first regular comic character. But having something like that, as a collector, mm -hmm. I notice that somebody's put sellotape down the side here. As a collector, would you not worry about actually oh, no, changing no, it and putting no, no, sellotape no, no, on? No, Well, I, that, is a, that is actually controversy amongst collectors. I mean, I think you try and get it back. You try and restore things into mm. their best condition, because otherwise, you see, look, already the corner's gone off that. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, I mean, otherwise it would just fall to pieces, and I could certainly never show it on Pebble Mill, you yeah. know, I'm not allowed to well, bring it. To with the advent of war, of course, there was a paper shortage. So what did they yes. use during the war? Well, it's very interesting. Uh, the war brought about the first British comic books, which were these sixpenny ones done in the American idiom, you see, because mm -hmm. all of a sudden the American comics no longer came over here. They, for some reason they thought there were more important things to put in the boats, you see, to send over from America. So uh, a man who was a market salesman called Gerald G. Swan uh, invented the comic book because he hadn't got any comic books to sell anymore, American ones, so he invented the British comic book, and that's where that started. What about these little ones down here? Oh, these little things? Well, the paper shortage again. Uh, the gay comic gives you an idea how w meanings of words have changed. Indeed, of course. they wouldn't get away with that no. these days, would they? Yeah, there was even one called the Sunday Fairy. Truly, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, these little things were sold in Woolworths, and they were printed on absolutely anything. I mean, that's one made of cardboard. Mm. This is actually one I drew, uh, which I was commissioned to draw, draw specially because they got some silver paper, the publishers, and uh, they wanted to do a comic printed on silver. I wonder, that, I wonder if people at home can see this yeah. one that I'm holding up here. Uh, if we look very, 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 very closely, we should see a very famous name here as the, the author um, of this, the cartoonist, yeah. Bob Monkhouse. Bob who? Bob Monkhouse. Oh, yes. He was a chap who there? sat next to me at school. We were great rivals, Truly? actually. Truly? Yes, yeah. producing our own comics. You've got some special comics over there, special editions. Jubilees, yes, I have. Yes. royal weddings. Well, this is really an example of the kind of things that you can look out for if you're collecting comics mm -hmm. that are really when a comic is produced for a special occasion. And these are some royalty comics. Right back in 1887, here's Alice Loper celebrating Queen Victoria's first jubilee. Not her second one, but her first one. Uh, there's the coronation of George V and Queen Mary in mm -hmm. 1911 in one of the first colour comics, Puck. Right. And then it goes straight on. There's Tiger Tim's Weekly, which a lot of people, I'm sure, will remember sure. the character. Mm -hmm. um, the Royal we've got Jubilee, the Eagle, got Bustle, the we've Eagle got, we've got Coronation Edition. Yeah. Actually, I wonder if I could just be very rude and stretch past you and have a look at these. Ah, so we've got the first uh -huh. Beano here. How much would that be worth these days? Well, that's very controversial. In the price guide I've just done, I, I estimated about £50. Oof. 
And this but actually looks... Let me I must sorry. tell you that not only has a boy bought one recently, complete with a free gift for 10 pence mm -hmm. <laughs> at an Oxfam shop, but a collector has actually also bought one for £450. So the range of value is absolutely enormous. Right. Thank you very much yeah. indeed, Dennis, for the moment. I've, as you can see, got hold of the dandy. Now, this is a facsimile of the first ever dandy, so it's not the real one, but it, it gives me an entree into my next guest because Corky the cat, who's on the front there, eventually was drawn by my guest, Charles Grigg. Now, Charles, how, how did you get together with, with the people who were producing the comic? How did the whole idea start and how did it evolve? Well, I was always interested in drawing right from being a boy. And um, I started to do some work at the end of the war, I think it was, for a local paper. Mm -hmm. And by devious means, this got to the knowledge of DC Thompson, who uh -huh. published Dandy and Dina. Uh -huh. And um, they got in touch with me and it all stems from there. And I began working in 1951 oh, yeah. for... Uh, Dandy and Vina. But you're working on Cocky the Cat there. Yeah. I noticed you've yeah. got a series of drawings yeah. here. Is this well, how you build them up? Yeah, well, you start off with the, with a pencil sketch as that, mm -hmm. and then it's you fill the lines in with ink, outline it, and uh, the finished drawing looks like that. Right, and eventually you would send this to D.C. Thompson in right. Dundee. That's your, as far as you're concerned, that's your finish, right? As far as I'm concerned, I, right. I get a script for that. Right, uh, of course. And uh, that is sent up in pencil. It's drawn out as mm -hmm. that first one. Sent up in pencil, it's okayed by the editor, comes back to me, I ink it in like that, and right. as far but as I'm concerned, that's the Sure, ending. then they colour it in, and it goes on they, the front page. It's coloured in the offices, Looking yes. like that, that's isn't right. that tremendous? That's right. Now, they were obviously very careful about what uh, young, uh, well, very impressionable minds were yeah. open to. And yeah. we've got a, a, an example here of a front yeah. cover you sent up, the Dandy Summer Special. Now, why did they send that back? Why did they say there was something wrong with ah, it? Ah, well, it was something... Usually, you, you get a, they send you and say, do a, a thumbnail sketch, a thumbnail, uh -huh. and this is the thumbnail sketch that I did. Inadvertently, I placed the nozzle, nozzle in rather a, an awkward position, <laughs> and when, when the drawing came back to me, there was a note from the editor, uh, remove the nozzle and put it in a more strategic place. So eventually, they did, they it was put it on the there. side here. And Desperate yes. Dan, whom you drew as well, I was surprised that I was actually based on a real figure. Yes. And that's him there. Uh, who is he? Well, Albert, this is Albert Barnes, who's the long-time editor of The Dandy, and he always asserted that Desperate Dan was modelled from him. And if you look at it, you, I think oh, you can see that, 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 is a, yeah. that is a resemblance. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. This takes me back to my childhood. It's smashing. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. I always thought Paul was something of a comic character. Well, still to come, the new single from...